Hi, everybody. Welcome to our CD lecture series. Um, today, we have Lin Yun, who is a New York-based type designer and educator who specializes in typography, hand lettering, and calligraphy. She was previously a full-time type designer at Monotype and served on the board of AIGA New York and the Society of Scribes. Prior to working at Monotype, Lynn held positions as a graphic designer at companies like Apple. She holds an BFA from the School of Visual Arts and a postgraduate certificate in typeface design from Type at Cooper Extended Program. Her work has been recognized by organizations like AIGA, Type Directors Club, and the Art Directors Club, and notably the Ascenders Award, which honors designers under the age of 35 who show remarkable achievement in typography, type design, and lettering. We're really fortunate and honored to have Lynn here with us, and please give her a great um, applause or a virtual applause. <laughs> so take it away, Lynn. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. All right. So, uh, sorry, I have lost all Zoom controls, but I just assume that you are all seeing my screen. Um, someone please like audibly say something if you can't see something. <laughs> Um, all right, cool. So uh, the, the lecture title is loosely named uh, Chasing Inspirations or They're Not Back Again Yet. It's a reference to The Hobbit. I'm a huge um, science fiction so fan. So we're not seeing your screen oh, now. Oh, you. yeah. Damn it, okay. <laughs> try again. That is, okay, let me, let me try again. I, uh, all right, so go. hopefully now you're seeing yes. this. Okay, great, yes. thank you so much. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Awesome. So Chasing Inspirations are there and not back again yet. So that's a reference to The Hobbit, if you are a Tolkien fan. Um, so I always struggle with this idea of having a defined creative practice and also just like just trying to find my place in the world as a designer, creative, um, whatever label that people give you these days as a professional <laughs> visual designer. Um, and when I was thinking about what I could share with you all, um, since this is a, a communication design lecture series, and uh, I'm assuming that most of you who are watching are design students or uh, people that uh, people who are just starting um, out in the field. And I think what I was always stressed out when I was younger is like this pressure to be creative. I think it seems like a very cliche thing. Like we have to be creative. We have to be good creatives, whatever that means. Um, and it seems like a really wild word to me because even as a young student, it always felt like I needed to be um, this, you know, creative with the capital C as, as people say these days, like you needed to be creative enough to get into a good art school. You needed to be creative enough to get into like a good company. And then after that, um, I'm assuming you want to be creative enough to be 30 under 30, 40 under 40 and, you know, so far and so forth. Um, but we can't live our lives like that day after day, right? Like, um, you know, you're not like a gigantic company with like some kind of North Star buzzword <laughs> um, goals on a daily basis. And over time, I've figured out that I just really like having a productive and happy day-to-day -day life. So like I figure out what I'm interested in, what I like to be doing um, in my spare time. And I think I've made peace with the fact that perhaps like for me, like that is my creative path. And I know that like learning new things doesn't really sound like a career path. So I just wanted to sh share with you all what is uh, what that has looked like, like for me. Um, and of course, uh, before I go on too far, I also wanted to show you a little bit of my background because I think for all of us where we have spent time and places we've been, people who we've met, they all eventually define us in one way or another. And uh, here are some things that I've been involved in in, in formal capacities. Um, I've worked for companies like Apple and Monotype. Um, I uh, went to the School of Visual Arts during undergrad. I pursued a type design uh, program at Type at Cooper. I later on did a residency at the School for Coding Computation. Um, and I'm in the process of finishing up my degree at uh, the ITP program at NYU. And I think it's important to point out that you learn from all your experiences, even if you don't necessarily agree with them, like them, or um, you know, even if you end up hating them afterwards, like it still means you learn something. And I think it's important to acknowledge the places that you've been. 
And the first job that I had uh, straight out of school was working at Apple. And I know like we've heard a lot of things about Silicon Valley, especially back in um, you know the early 2010s. Uh, but I think the project that really defined um, a, a, like some sort of like marker in my life was making this eight for iOS eight. Uh, I, I mean, I made that eight for, I think like two months, it was just like nonstop, just drawing like one figure eight. And it really wasn't good. Um, like, I like really cringe at this. But you know, like, I think like the lesson that I learned is that like that went up officially online. And then of course, there was this like Twitter conversation, like who drew that eight? The optical weight is off, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then of course, like after that, like I was that person that's like, oh, no, I made a terrible eight, I really need to go learn how to make an eight. And I ended up at the Cooper Union's uh, type of Cooper program. And so like there, I really learned how to draw letters as a type designer. And eventually, after I finished the program, um, I still wasn't ready to commit to being a full time type designer. I think uh, I was somewhere between this like logo type designer and a graphic designer. So I was making a lot of work for advertising companies just like this. Um, this is a, a mural for a hockey team in Pittsburgh. And uh, over time, I just really liked drawing, <laughs> uh, drawing letter forms. And I have a huge fascination, including, um, you know, historical backgrounds and technology and all of a lot of these things. But what I but what I really appreciate about letter forms is just my capacity to appreciate them when I'm drawing it. It's kind of like having a, a go to nice subject to be working on all the time. So here are some uh, paintings that I've done. So here is a sketch on the left side and the W, the, the Gothic looking W is rendered in gouache um, on the right side. And so here you see some other pieces of lettering that I was doing during this time. And I have to admit that the work that I was doing during the daytime in an advertising agency wasn't uh, creatively fulfilling. Um, so I was running that path of doing something more interesting in the evenings in my own spare time to sort of offset that, right? Um, I, I, I think I was the most productive in my own personal work when I was making a lot of rebate coupons for Sherwin-Williams Sherwin paint cans. Um, $5 off if you mail this coupon in kind of deal. Um, so, uh, you know, so there are always uh, glamour sides and unglamour sides to every single job. And I often think that when you're uh, starting out, it might seem like there's not a lot of outlets that you can um, pursue, but like one of the things that you do have control over is your own free time after work. Um, and obviously like a little bit of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, ambition as a young person <laughs> um, definitely goes a long way when uh, for, for these kind of things where uh, I was making a hand painted map of the United States. And you can see that uh, that's me on the top right side with a teeny tiny little paintbrush and jeweler's glasses. So like these are like magnifying glasses that you can put on your head. Um, and you can see that I made the crucial mistake of starting on the left side, like so the, on the west coast and then going to the east. So all the states are giant when it's on the east, uh, sorry, it's on, when it's on the west side. So you can imagine like my, my anguish as I kept going on towards the right. And I, and I thought I was being smart by being a righty, but you no. Know. You, you live and you learn. And I think eventually my interests, um, not eventually, like my, my interests are always changing over time. I think when I think about everything that I've done so far, it really comes out of a curiosity that I just really want to fulfill. And a part of um, this is what I was saying earlier about how I really wanted to be able to draw an eight in the proper way. So that led to me being more of a letter form specialist. And then this is where my fascination with calligraphy starts. I think I was just looking at some logo or something. I don't remember exactly what, but I distinctly remember seeing the A and the V next to each other. Um, and I was thinking about how the A is thick on the right, but the V is thick on the left. And I thought that this was really weird because it's not, um, you know, it's not very self-explanatory. 
So I started thinking about like why this was, and then I figured out that the lesson in calligraphy solves a lot of these problems. Um, I figured out that with like a pen and ink, like the physicalities don't really allow you to have a thick stroke going up. Um, so, you know, up the hill is thin and then down the hill is thick. And eventually this little foray into calligraphy led me to uh, do a lot more calligraphy and then eventually incorporate it in my professional work. Um, so here are some drafts for the Lincoln Center that I was doing with Small Stuff um, some years ago. And what I also discovered was that being able to use multiple tools, um, digital or physical, really allows you to expand your way of thinking because I think there are a lot of limitations that the tool gives you that you're not really aware of until you start using different kinds of tools that let you break out of that mold. Um, so at this time, like I was, I was using a lot of uh, vector programs like Adobe Illustrator and so forth. And uh, even though I got proficient later on with uh, tracing paper and pencils, it really doesn't be just like calligraphy pen uh, because in the time that it would take you to draw like one letter, you've already done an entire word um, if you can use a pen and ink very well. And eventually I start doing more and more doodling as I have a pen in my hand. And then that leads me down this entire path of learning how to flourish. And uh, I mean, that's a whole another story for a whole another day, but eventually I just could keep on going that, down this path enough. Um, and at some point, as I was browsing eBay one late last night on uh, manuscripts, as board calligraphers do, maybe, or maybe it's just me, um, but I found this little manuscript page. Um, and I think it was like $30 or something, like this like manuscript page that was from like the 1400s because it has no illustration on it was extremely affordable, for, you know, for something from the 1400s. Um, so I bought it and you can see from this quarter here that it's actually really, really small. And I really wanted to learn this style. And I was looking at it a lot and I was really trying to find if there was any calligrapher that would teach me the style, but it turned out that there wasn't. Um, so I figured out, uh, I figured that, well, if someone wrote it, I can probably also try to write it. And this started this um, almost like two year long, a uh, part-time of course, uh, research into how to reverse engineer this script. Um, so the way I did this in an abbreviated format was that I scanned this, um, I did a lot of research into the type of manuscript that this was, I uh, took tracing paper and then extracted the skeletal forms, and then the thing that I learned a lot is that there's a lot of physical uh, physicality that, co that goes into writing manuscripts, uh, because there's like the viscosity of the ink. Um, and then there's like the way that the human hand wants to write things. Um, fortunately, we all have uh, a limited number of wrists and a limited number of, um, you know, joint flexibility. So it's kind of uh, perceivable that my ability to write wouldn't be too different from a medieval scribe. So, uh, but me not being a proficient uh, medieval scribe, I started out in a bigger size and then eventually it transitioned to smaller and smaller sizes. And I think at one point I went down this rabbit hole of how to prepare manuscripts. So I got little pieces of vellum and I was um, writing with like a goose quill. And eventually I just realized that like, this is all great, but I also live in the, um, you know, in, in, in the 2000s and I can't be cutting with goose quills every single day. And I also wanted to make it uh, viable for me because it's great to have the ability to write a medieval manuscript, but also I wanted to be able to write this for myself in the modern tools that I have. Um, so here is where I was learning how to write this uh, hand. And eventually I, I got familiar with the hand enough so I could just write it out of um, you know, muscle memory as opposed to trying to an analyze every single letter. And you can see here that I'm you know, doing uh, modern looking words that have words like uh, an X, for example, that didn't exist back, back then. Um, so this is like another one of those hobbies that became a really uh, deep, dark rabbit hole. Um, and eventually uh, I taught workshops and things on this hand. Um, so even though it seems that 
pursuing some sort of mildly weird interest you have um, seems like it'll lead nowhere. Uh, sometimes it does, and sometimes it's enjoyable. And often you'll have a lot of fun just getting there in the first place. Um, OK, I'm still writing in that video. Yeah. All right, so I'll move on. And eventually these things seem to live like, uh, you know, they seem to live in separate rooms in your head, but they do come together at some point because you are just one person. So here is an example where I was doing calligraphy and eventually I decided to make a lettering piece out of it. So you can see the, um, the letters written with the calligraphy pen on the top left, and you can see it turning into a lettering piece uh, meaning that I was rendering all of them with a pen and pencil on tracing paper and um, it started getting little nuances that you can't get from, you know, straight up um, a writing tool in ink. And then eventually I vectorized it and then made it into a design that I could uh, laser cut out of, out of paper. So everything had to connect and not fall through. So like this is, uh, this is just an example of knowing different kinds of processes can always merge together to, you know, um, for you to be able to adapt it into different kinds of scenarios. And then another recent project that I, I've been doing is a typeface that's inspired by calligraphy. So here you can see the original sketch uh, that I did with the pen up on top. And you can see that there's a lot of inconsistencies, right? Like every time I write the A because I'm writing it with a physical tool, it'll be different. Um, and here you can see that I digitized it and I was slowly making it uh, harmonize because the nature of a writing tool is very different from the nature of a digital font file that needs to work with every other letter um, in the alphabet. So like I was like trying to reconcile those differences like slowly but surely. But I am a firm believer that without the ability to without my ability to have experimented in the actual pen and ink, like I probably would not have been able to get to the digital uh, result. So yeah, here is just a random sample from a sketchbook that I was trying to sketch out letters in. Uh, and you can see that like the process is different. If it was like a you know, pencil and marker sketch, maybe I would have made like three and refined them over and over. But because this is pen and ink, um, I just keep writing more and more of them. Um, and here you can see that after I got to some sort of form that I wanted it to be, I was refining it with a pencil and then eventually it got brought on digitally. And you can see um, just like these previews of the typeface in different uh, styles and weights. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, <laughs> I was having a lot of fun with different kinds of ampersands. And so this is like the part uh, where um, I, I just show you a couple of things that I've made for uh, monotype, which um, I used to work at full time for about like two and a half years. Um, I left, uh, I think, last fall. But here you can see some typefaces that I was working on. And this is a layer typeface. So I was working uh, with um, a th three different styles that would layer on top of each other to make this dimensional form. And you can see that I, I still try to retain a lot of that experimentation that I do uh, with the hand. And you can see here that uh, even with um, something that seems as straightforward as a beveled design, like there is really no such thing as it being straightforward. You can see like the little minute difference in designs that I was trying on, uh, trying out. And here you can see um, the, the other style. And so these are typefaces that you would have layered on. And um, it's funny when I'm making typefaces because I think about how my interests are just going more and more down this um, like onion layer of information almost. <laughs> and let me unpack that for a second. Um, so. Uh, I was interested in design, like graphic design as a whole. And then I got interested in typography. And then I got interested in uh, 
you know, type design. And then like from there, like I got interested in calligraphy, which is um, like the historical background of type design. And then, uh, you know, like, where do you really go from there? And I was sort of stuck here for a little bit. Um, and eventually I figured out that um, I was really curious about how fonts worked. Uh, so like as a type designer, you make uh, typefaces over and over again, they get packaged into a little tiny font file that you can um, send out to people. But like, what is a font file anyway? And this is actually an interesting question because I was thinking about how when I was growing up, um, I used to be able to, you know, hack things or, you know, build little things. Like I think when a radio wouldn't work like I would just, you know, get out a Phillips screwdriver and I would um, take them apart, uh, hoping that I could put it back together in the state that it worked. Um, I was definitely like the like the really nerdy kid in school that was like trying to be like, like my video games are going to run so smoothly because I upgraded my RAM or, you know, like that kind of kid. Um, and, you know, like it, it was wild to me that I just didn't know how to take apart a font file um, because it's just on my screen or somewhere on my computer. <laughs> and uh, so I started to think about like, what if I could take apart a font file, just like I could take apart any other thing. Like now, of course, like it seems like everything is sort of like blocked in together, right? Like when you see a phone, like there's no little tiny screw holes in the back, like there used to be at some point. Um, and like, uh, I guess like when you, download an app from the app store like there's nothing physical like it just like shows up on your phone and you can't really like open it up right um so <laughs> I, I really got interested into programming and here um is just a slide where i was like just trying to like um express to you like how i'm just like really interested in this like evolution of technology and like how people are um you know building things and so here is a little <laughs> diagram of little planets that I've been at so far. So I was in graphic design and then I went to type design and now I'm getting into um, coding. And what I've discovered in my foray into technology is that type is also an onion layer of things where like type as a concept um, is a visual system, right? Like when you type in when you're trying to typeset like a word, you expect the A to be similar to the T and E and so forth. Like everything has a visual system. Um, but then when you start to look into it in a little bit more detailed way, you notice that it's a modular system, right? Um, if you're, uh, you know, if you've like sort of tried to dissect things uh, in your typography class, like you probably have realized that uh, some parts are sort of uh, reused and you start to see that modular system behind it. So when you're thinking about, let's say like an F, it probably seems like the E and the F are very similar. Um, and like, you know, like the F sort of looks like the E without the bottom bar and so forth, right? Um, so like when you're learning type design, you learn that everything is a modular system. Um, and it's like little Lego pieces that you put together and take apart in order to make a bigger system. And then what I learned when I started to get into programming is that type is an instructional system. Um, so uh, you, you can all do this. Like if you have a font file on your computer, you can just drag it into like any kind of text editor and you'll see like this like bunch of like type is just a bunch of texts. Um, and you'll see that there's like little coordinates inside those files. Like what a font file is, is that it's a series of instructions that is letting the computer know how this should be drawn. Um, and we can we can talk about this for a very long time um, since computer at its core is still a very much you know like a zero one zero one um, I'm, I'm getting too much into this but <laughs> when I realized that typefaces were instructional um, I also realized that it's very much possible to unpack these instructions that are inside a, a font file and to do something with it um, so here are some sketches that I was doing. I, at the time I was going to the School for Poetic Computation, which I think is still in the West Village um, in New York City. So here is an exploration that I was doing in uh, Zach Lieberman's class for Open Frameworks. So this is um, Helvetica actually, that I was trying to make into a, a, you know, a three-dimensional thing. Um, I, I wasn't quite sure where I was going with that, but uh, at the core of it, what 
uh, the instructions on the left side are doing is that there's this little helicopter thing that's drawing lines as it's going around the parameters of an X. Um, and then on the right side is a word. Um, it was inspired by Muriel Cooper. So like it has the word Cooper. And if a certain coordinate is inside the inner parts of a letter, it's um, bigger and closer to uh, the viewer and like the further it is, like it's more further, sort of like a little grid star system. Um, <laughs> and eventually I was wondering what it takes to have a parameter uh, for time. Um, so here you can see that the outlines are getting drawn for T-I-M-E, and then the, the outlines are getting degraded over time. Um, so you can see them turning into little blobs. Yeah, so you can see them turning into little blobs over time. And since then, I have been doing a lot more with technology and type. Um, and I just want to share a few projects that I've done in relation to that. Uh, here is me uh, doing a machine learning project. Um, so basically trying to teach a computer how to do something. Um, so a, again, stands for a generative adversarial network. Um, and uh, if this all sounds like mumbo jumbo, like don't worry too much about it <laughs> because uh, there is a really great platform called Runway that lets you start out machine learning um, even with you know, zero coding experience. It's really, really friendly. Um, so I, to start out with machine learning, I was using Runway and then I needed to collect data from somewhere because I wanted to work with letter forms. And although I could sit here and draw a thousand letters, uh, that would be really time consuming and it really wouldn't be crucial to what I was trying to do uh, because I was trying to teach a machine how to draw letters, right? Um, you know, some, some, sometimes you can't start from the very, the very, very granu granular um, uh, step, uh, let's say. Um, sometimes I just want to go by flower instead of growing growing crops and waiting a year. So uh, I discovered that MyFonts has an API. So MyFonts um, has a structure that lets you pull uh, their data. So what I did was that um, I pulled a lot of font images from the MyFonts API. And you can see that I had a gigabytes worth of images um, at some point. And I think for this project, I set up a parameter for myself that I wanted it to be sans serifs because sans serifs seemed like a very particular look that I could try to um, get the machine to draw for me. So <laughs> I downloaded more than 50,000 images um, from the MyFonts API. And then I also had to manually beat out like 20,000 or something like that. Um, so like sometimes a lot of the work is in collecting the information more than doing the actual thing itself. But I just wanted to point this out because it's not some sort of magical algorithm from the sky that I was like, you know, please give me a sans serif and it happened. <laughs> so not quite there, but you can see that the original model uh, was trained on human faces. So you'll, you'll see this like uncanny valley of human faces turning into, <laughs> um, you know, letters so, because I was training it first on letters uh, like the letter A, but it started with faces. So you can see them turning into letters. And, you know, it's not always perfect. This is like my first try. You can see like, instead of uh, people's faces turning into letters, they're turning into these like weird, like penguin shapes or whatever. Um, so uh, nothing, nothing really happens, um, you know, one shot. But eventually I was able to get into, um, get it to produce A's for me. That looked pretty sans serif -y. Um, And then I trained it on a short word, like A-S-H. -A um, because I figured like an H was also pretty standard and an S was also a pretty standard shape. Um, and it already knew like the A, so I could just sort of like shimmy it in there. So you can see um, the word ash here. And here's a still image, so you can see what's going on without all the, <laughs> uh, without all the wild things going on. And you can see that the machine clearly recognizes uh, what the A, S, H should look like. Although there's more variations in the A, presumably because um, designs for the A vary a lot more than it would for the H, for instance. Um, you can imagine that for an A, it might have a little like hat, it might have a little bit of a slant, maybe it has like a 
a round top, maybe had as a pointy top. Like there's other ways that the A could look, which is why it looks a little bit more shaky. And um, after after I did this, I realized that well, this is this is cool, but it. I mean, like, that's like sort of where my interest would have stopped because I was like, okay, like, this is all great, but like, it's not as great as me just drawing it, <laughs> right? Like, there's none of these that I would look at this and be like, ah, oh, like, that would be an awesome font. Um, and I would want to, if and I would want to use it in all my projects, um, there's, you know, there's not much of that going on um, yet anyway. Um, so eventually I was like, okay, what other ways could I try to get the machine to make a letter for me? Um, and like the next thing that I tried was training a model called GPT-2, which specializes in generating text. And like all of this is, um, you know, like just like runway, like all, all, this model is also available for you to train if you're so inclined on Google CoLab. Um, so here you can see that like I was using an existing uh, notebook as they call it, like a set of, uh, um, like a, like a platform that lets you run code in a certain specific order, uh, which is why, you know, it's kind of like a digital notebook. Um, so you can see here what I, uh, what I was doing in order to produce these. And if you remember earlier on when I was trying to tell you that the, you know, all font files at its core is just a series of instructions. Um, so like, this is where I went back to that concept. And this is, a, this is not a font file, this is an SVG that I opened up. But you can see here um, that, you know, on the top, it says this is SVG version, whatever. And then like later on, like it has like this like thing called path, right? Like it shows you what it's drawing. Um, so like these are uh, the instructions that this file is using in order to render this K on the left side. So you can imagine, um, I mean, let me, let me try to make an analogy. Like if you can imagine like following a recipe, like that says like step one, like you crack open an egg and mix it in a bowl, like step two, like put sugar into this bowl. Um, so it's kind of like that, but just with a coordinate <laughs> on this imaginary surface. So I was like, okay, so all a letter is, is a series of instructions. I'll get a ton of different Ks and I'll throw these, these like instructions into a GPT-2 model and hopefully it will give me a K. Um, so I downloaded over 600 images of a K, I converted all of them um, to an SVG and then I converted all the SVGs um, into a text file and I ran them through the model. And guess what? <laughs> Most of them didn't work. Um, so this is like the best one that I got. So, you know, sometimes you have ideas and it doesn't work, but, <laughs> uh, you know, it's like the same thing as sometimes like you think this company is awesome and you go there and it's actually not that great. Um, uh, you know, but I think there's always something to learn from here. And because I tried this, um, it allows me to do other things. So after I failed at this experiment, um, I could have thrown, you know, 10,000 more hours into this, but I was like, you know what, I'm going to tr try something new. And the next thing that I did was uh, making a computational tool where I had more input because what I had learned from the previous two experiments was that I actually wanted to have more input because just letting the machine do like, you know, I was preparing things, but like letting the machine draw like 90% of the work really wasn't um, doing it for me. Um, so uh, I was really inspired by Metafont. So Metafont um, if you ever look at it, it's like M-E-T-A and then F-O-N-T uh, by, by Donald Newth um, is like a way a font could be rendered in multiple different ways. Like it has this like skeletal form and then you can transform it into multiple different ways. Um, anyway, so I was inspired by that. And then <laughs> of course, as with anything, you always want to start from somewhere, uh, partially because uh, I don't want to invent anything from the entire ground up, right? Um, so I consulted with um, uh, Alison Parrish, uh, who I greatly admire. Uh, she's an amazing poet and um, programmer and teacher. And this is a library that uh, she had for Python. So this is the first time where I was trying to create a, a standalone program with Python. So this is, this is what I made. And I'll just talk over the illustration. So what's happening is that there is a program that will allow you to draw a skeletal form 
and then it'll like put clothes on top of it um, to the to the dimensions that you're specifying it. So you can see that there's like these four colors, which um, <laughs> which give you these skeletal forms. And then depending on what kind of stroke width or like stroke um, shape you want them to have um, here, you can input it underneath that brush color. Um, and then every time you refresh, it'll give you that. So I know this might not seem like super exciting as <laughs> um, as someone that that you know that can draw just like with like pen and paper in like a better form. But like you can imagine that if you had a whole set of uh, of letters like um, experimenting for like an entire set uh, of letters for like a typeface, for example, um, this might come in handy. Um, I mean, this is like an early iteration, so it looks buggy, but it's kind of it's kind of cute in its own little way. And I think the advantage of me learning digital tools is that like, now I think of digital tools as something that's warm. Um, I think I used, when I, when I didn't make anything digitally, like I was, I was definitely like the kind of student that was like, I'm only ever gonna draw everything. Like I'm gonna draw all my letters, all my work is going to be lettering because like fonts are so cold, computers are so cold. Um, and I think partially it just came from the, the fact that I didn't know how to use um, digital tools in the capacity that I do now. So like when I use uh, fonts, for example, these days, like, you know, like I use them and I'm just like, oh, like this is from my friend David or like, it feels very human to me in a way um, it didn't seem like it uh, before. And so like, this is like the way that I think of programs now. Um, you know, sometimes I use little tiny scripts or programs that uh, people have made and you know sometimes they're from people that I know personally sometimes it's random stranger from the internet uh, but it always feels a little bit more warm to me because like now I know that technology is something that can be built and uh, <laughs> let's go forward um, you know but like that's that's sort of the formal things that I'm working on um, but you can like find me doing a lot of different things uh, you know all throughout the, the years, days, months, whatever. Um, so here's like random things that I'm up to at any given time. Um, I think I went to Brooklyn Glass to take like a eight week course in neon um, tube bending. So this is, this is me learning how to do neon tubes. I was really into wood cutting for a while. I think I saw a lecture um, for like a woodcut artist and I was like really, really inspired to go to go do this. So here you can see, uh, I, th I think I took like three semesters worth of it. Um, and this is like after I graduated from undergrad. So you can see eventually I got up to the point where I could carve out these really teeny tiny italic letters that you can, you know, you can see the size with a quarter here. Yeah, so, and eventually I made prints of my cat who I really love, who is still 10 and a half and still around, um, thankfully. And then I really learned, I really wanted to make calligraphy into something more useful than this thing that lives on paper. So I learned how to do more digital fabrication. So you can see this laser cutter that I was using um, to make a lamp. And with calligraphy, I made that pattern. And you can see uh, the lamp that I was uh, prototyping. Um, and, you know, I sometimes say I'll do things even if I don't exactly know how to do them. <laughs> so it, here, here is a, here's a sketch where a friend of mine who had the World Trade Center as his client was like, hey, I really need some sort of graphic to welcome people at the World Trade Center 2 site. Like, can you draw something? This is gonna be really cool. And I was like, okay, and I drew this. Um, and for full disclosure, I think I was like, I think I was on, on like a trip somewhere. I was definitely in Berlin. I think I drew this in like a, um, on like a train tray. And I just like sent it off and I kind of completely forgot about it because it was like this like vacation haze. And then a few months later, they're like, okay, can you paint this? I was like, okay. <laughs> So this is what it looks like in the world uh, around the World Trade Center right now. Um, so here you can see images from me painting this. So you can see that you know that that little red arrow pointing to me that's like really small and really tall. It's it was um, I think it's about like twenty feet by forty feet. Like it's a very large piece of structure. I can't imagine. I can't I can't remember the exact dimensions, but you can see how big it was compared to me. 
um, who's like five foot tall. So here you can see me painting on this thing and I was really scared of heights, but I got over it and it was great. And then uh, the next summer, uh, the same company contacted me and they were like, can you do another mural? And I was like, okay, um, as long as I can draw letters. And so this is, this is what I had in my sketches and it eventually turned into this. And here's a little video. Oh, hopefully you can hear the sound, maybe not. Yeah. Okay. So there we go. <laughs> um, so the last thing that I want to show you before I open up the um, the platform, um, the everyone. I don't know what how to address the audience in Zoom uh, for uh, for for Q and A. Uh, I wanted to show you this um, new new website that me and my partner made for our new. Uh, company. So the the new thing uh, for me is like to try to work with interactive type. Um, so here you can see like this is like a website that we made uh, that um, you can interact with. I mean like it's it's just supposed to be fun as well as uh, it be it's serving a um, a purpose for like a, a landing page for our studio. So like here you can see that like we're taking advantage of the fact that um, fonts have uh, these coordinates that you can uh, move around. Um, here you can see like, you know, like these like fonts, um, I, it's actually pretty slow because I think Zoom is messing around with my little computer. Uh, yeah, but you can see like there's a lot of like things that you can play with. Um, so that is, um, that's sort of where I'm at. And let me actually, <laughs> Oh, actually, I think it's still sharing. Yeah, I'll just talk over it. Um, yeah, so like this is this is where I'm at right now. So I'm always trying to figure out what is most interesting for me at the time, and this is where I've landed. But it really doesn't mean that like I'm I'm like stuck here. I think I am slowly making peace with the fact that what I like to do always is changing, and to just not be insecure about that. Because I think even until very recently, I was very insecure about the fact that. Um, I wasn't becoming a super specialist in like this, like one very specific thing. Um, because to me, it seemed like you just want to be like the go-to person for this very specific special thing. Um, and I was just always continuously going down these new rabbit holes. Um, so I guess like that sort of sums up to the, the title of this lecture, which is, uh, let me go back, um, you know, it's like, chasing inspirations are there and not back again yet. Uh, because unlike Bilbo, I have not yet gotten back to the Shire, but, <laughs> but maybe that's okay. Um, yeah, uh, and I hope that uh, this sort of gives you another perspective um, that you can in fact 
you know, have multiple interests and like, you know, that's, it's not detrimental to your career. Okay, sorry. I am like trying to find my mouse, which I have found again. Okay, great. Um, so if you, I mean, feel free to pop in any questions in the chat um, or ask any questions. I know like there's like a YouTube stream um, and like there's like a Zoom window, um, but I think Casper is, <laughs> um, hope, Casper will hopefully give me questions. Uh, but if you ever wanna um, contact me on other channels, like here it is. And thank you for listening.